Hello everyone, welcome to the Lee Kong Chen Natural History Museum's Thursday Talk Shop series. I'm Ja and today my colleague Cherry and myself from the Outreach and Education Unit will be hosting today's session. So um, for those who don't know about the Lee Kong Chen Natural History Museum, we are this rock-shaped building located in the campus of the National University of Singapore. Okay, So we are the largest and oldest natural history museum in Southeast Asia. We have over a million specimens, plants and animals within the wet and dry collections. And um, it's about 2,000 specimens on display. Uh, we're still open so can still come visit us actually. Okay. So at the Outreach and Education Unit, we conduct a very such as gallery tours and workshops, nature walks and virtual programs as well. So some of you might remember that we had three sessions of this virtual series during the May school holidays last year. So for those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, uh, you can check out the previous sessions uh, in the link which is going to be posted in the chat box now and you can view the recordings there. Okay, so um, just a couple of house rules. So um, I think we've muted all of you because we don't want any interruptions during the program, of course. Um, but I think I heard some of you uh, unmuting yourself. So kindly just refrain from unmuting yourselves until the end of the session at least. And um, also we have disabled the chat box because we also don't want any interactions. But uh, if you have any questions, please send them in the chat box directly to OU staff one or OU staff two. So if you see under the participant list, right, you can actually see two co-hosts that are named OU staff one or two. Um, if you have any questions or anything at all, uh, please send the questions directly to them. We will compile it and as much to our abilities, we'll try to answer them towards the end of today's session. Okay. So today's topic, nature and us, is a very broad topic, one with uh, a lot of different interesting points to discuss. And today what we'll actually be doing is to focus on the Singapore context, a local context, so it's actually closer to home. So how humans shape and influence the local biodiversity around us. We'll also be taking a look at this over a timeline, so we're going to see how this has changed from the past, the present, uh, and how will it be in the future. We'll also be having some poll questions in the middle, and this is just purely for learning fun, so don't be afraid, it's anonymous as well, so don't be worried if you get the wrong answer. So do try them out when the poll questions pop up uh, on your screen, okay? So um, before today's session, when you guys were all registering for the session, right, we also asked you um, to share with you, uh, share with us if you have any encounters with wildlife before, and some of you very uh, nicely shared with us some of your experiences, and thank you very much for that. Uh, we've placed some of these um, experiences on this slide over here, and we will taking a closer look at uh, some of them later during the session. Okay, so now I'll hand it over to Cherry uh, to actually start off the session. All right, so good afternoon everyone. So before we start with the talk shop, we would like to find out more about how you perceive the relationship between nature and us. So to do this, we are going to launch this word cloud poll where you can answer this question. So use a word or two to describe the relationship between nature and us. So you can use your mobile device to scan the QR code as shown on the screen in front of you, or you can click on the link that's provided in the chat box. So you can go to pigeonhole.at and enter the passcode. Okay, so you can take your mobile phone to scan the QR code to access the word cloud, or you can click the link provided in the chat. Okay, so it can be positive or negative. So just a word or two to describe this relationship between nature and us, just an adjective. So the word with the most numbers of entries or most vote will appear big in the word cloud. Okay, so I shall toggle over to the word cloud and let's see the response. All right, so you can see that the word with the most entry or most vote will appear big in this word cloud. So you can see the biggest word so far is important. So indeed, the relationship between nature and us is important. Symbiotic, which is the relationship between um, two organisms. Yes, symbiotic, complicated, interdependent, that's right. So you can see there are both positive and negative remark here. So we have misunderstood. Peace, that's right. Competitive, peaceful, unavoidable harmony. So these are some examples of your perceptions of the relationship between nature and us. Okay, so it's like important is still the word with the most entry or the most, the highest number of books. 
Okay, I see the word coexisting. So yes, you can see a mix of positive and negative um, to describe this relationship between nature and us. Okay, so thank you everyone for this contribution. So it's great to see that you'll contribute uh, to this question. All right, so let's get back to the talk shop, to the slides. Okay, so over the years, we have seen this extensive development on our small uh, land size, and yet we do have an immense diversity of wildlife in Singapore. So preserving and protecting this natural environment took a lot of effort. And yes, you will be going through some of this effort in this talk shop as well. But before that, we will first start by sharing the past impact on our natural environment. So back in the past, back in 1819, a trading settlement was established on our island. And just 30 years later, half of our forests were cleared to grow commercially viable cash crops like your rubber, gambia, coconut, and nutmeg, as shown in the photos in the slides. So this is deforestation, the removal of forests for other purposes, and in this case, for plantation. So back then, the economy was very important, so to be able to meet the needs of a fast-growing population. But what about before 1890, in the pre-1800? So the main primary forest cover back then was the lowland bee terracot forest, along with mangrove and freshwater swan forests. So these are called the deep terracot trees. They are known as the giants of the forest. So they are family of hardwoods that occurs in the tropical region or tropical forests across the world. And here comes our first poll question. So it's just for fun and learning. So do try to answer this poll question that is coming right up. Okay, so the first question is, what does the word deterocup mean? So is it A, detero means four wings and couples means fruits, or B, detero means two wings and couples means fruits, or C, detero means uh, two wings and couples means flower? So what, which do you think is the correct answer? What does deterocup mean? Okay, so about 50% of you have contributed to this poll. So let's wait for a few more seconds. Okay, last 10 seconds to contribute. We have almost 75%. All right, so let's share the results. Okay, so as you can see in front of you, most of you, 52% of you have chosen B. B tarot means two wing and couples means fruits and that is the correct answer. So B is the correct answer. Okay. So in green, heron actually means two wing. Hold on. I think there's some. Okay. So detero means uh, two wing and couples means fruits. And the wind light structures fruits, as you can see on the image here, it helps in the dispersal, the wind dispersal. So there are about 500 species found in Southeast Asia, and they made up to 50 to 80% of the forest canopy. So at maturity, they can live up to 100 years old, and some of these trees can grow up to 80 meters in height. So this low growing tree plays a huge role in our forest because they are habitats and food for the animals. So in Singapore, we used to have many of these deer tarot carp trees, but due to deforestation for plantation and development, these trees are mostly retreated to places like Bukit Timah Nature Reserve and Central Catchment Nature Reserve. So we started to conserve our natural environment only in the late 1900, uh, 19th century, sorry, in the late 19th century, so the next poll question is, which animal do you think were the first to be legally protected from unlicensed killing, wounding, or taking? So is it A, birds, B, amphibians, or C, mammals? So which groups of animals do you think were the first to be legally protected in the late 19th century? Okay, a few more seconds for you to answer this question. All 
All right. Okay, so let's view the answer to this question. Okay, so majority of you have uh, indicated that uh, mammals were the first animal to be illegally protected. Okay, and 32% of you have chosen birds and 7% of you have chosen amphibians. So let's share the correct answer. Okay, so in fact, the animal that were first uh, legally protected is our feathery friends, our birds. Okay, so the birds were first protected under the Wild Birds Protection Ordinance that was enacted in the 1884. So this legislation extended out to other wildlife under the Wild Animals and Birds Protection Ordinance that was enacted in 1904. Okay, so birds were the first animal to be protected. Next, so what about protecting our forests? So in the 1882, the superintendent of the Singapore Botanic Gardens, Nathaniel Kenley, actually surveyed the forest and he estimated that only 7% of the original forest was left. Because there was no legal protections for forests back then, he proposed the creation of forest reserve. So this was done in an intention to protect forests against illegal deforestation and identifying forests the supply of wood. So in 1883, we have our forest reserve. So can you make a guess how many forest reserves were first identified in 1882? How many forest reserves do you think were identified back then? So is it A, 15, B, 30, or C, 3? So take note that we only have four nature reserves in Singapore now, right? So back then, how many forest reserves were there? Okay, almost 70% of you have contributed to this poll. All right. Okay, let me end this poll and let's see the results. Okay, so majority of you, 44% of you, uh, have picked A, 15, while the other 40% of you have picked C, 3. So the correct answer is actually 15. So yes, there were 15 forest reserves in Singapore. And here on the slide, you can see the list of these forest reserves. So this was taken from the 1886 Forest Department Annual Report. And they only stated 14 here. So the 15 forest reserve was actually Sungai Bulo. So yes, these 15 forest reserves were protected from illegal deforestation. You can also view the forest reserve in this old map of Singapore here. So the dark patches were our 15 forest reserve. But wait, how many nature reserves do we have today? We only have four, right? So what exactly happened? So this was because back in the 1925, the colonial government started to question the values of preserving forests in Singapore. Well, the cause did not seem to justify it because they were too expensive to maintain and were unable to generate revenue from the timber trade. So it was also difficult to, preserve, uh, to prevent illegal cutting. So there was a problem in the enforcement. So due to this reason, all these forest reserves were revolted soon later but selected areas like Bukit Hima were still protected. So over time, people discovered the value of forests which contributed to their protection. For example, Bukit Hima was found to have samples of interesting plants for research, and the values of forests was understood as a sanctuary for plants and animals. So over time, the law aimed to protect and preserve the flora and fauna in nature reserves and provide opportunities for study and research so in 1985, there was the Nature Reserve Act, which was replaced by the National Park Act in 1990. So we see so much appreciation for nature now, even from the members of the public. So due to this growing awareness and cause for conservation, we now have 24 nature areas, which include our four nature reserves in Singapore. So our next poll question is, where are our four nature reserves at present? Is it A, Bukit Pato, Amokyo, Pasiris, Labrador? B, Bukit Tima, Central Catchment, Sungai Bulo, Labrador? Or C, Bukit Gomba, Central Catchment, Sungai Bulo, and Labrador? 
Okay, can you name our four nature reserves in Singapore? All right, so let's end this poll and let's view your results. All right, okay, so you can see that yes, majority of you, 90% of you have chosen B. So B is the correct answer. Okay, so that's right. Our four nature reserves are the, our Central Catchment Nature Reserve, Bukit Timah Nature Reserve, uh, Labrador Nature Reserve, and Sungai Buloh Wetland Reserve. So the park and tree ads protect these four nature reserves. So next, let's focus on three specific examples of organisms that were used to be found in Singapore. So because of deforestation habitat loss, we unfortunately have had three animals or more than three animals that are thought to be locally extinct. So we're looking at three examples. So locally extinct means that these animals cannot be found in Singapore, but can still be found overseas. So first we have our Malayan tiger. So yes, we do have wild tigers in Singapore. However, due to habitat loss and deforestation for plantation, we encroach into the habitat and this trigger tiger attack. So every year, up to 300 humans were killed by tigers and tiger attack was a real cause for concern back then. So due to this high fatality rate by the tigers, there were intensive hunts for tiger and money were given as an incentive to capture and kill this tiger. So because of all these incentives killing of tiger, they went locally extinct in Singapore, meaning they cannot be found in Singapore, but can still be found overseas. So the last tiger was shot in 1930. And can you make a guess where do you think the last tiger was shot in Singapore? Which location? Is it A, Bugit Timah? B, Pula Ubin, or C, Chuatrukan. So which location or where do you think the last tiger was shot in Singapore? All right, a few more seconds to take part in this poll. All right, so let me end this poll and share the results. Okay, so most of you have picked either Bukit Tima or Chuatrukan. Okay, and the answer is actually Chuatrukan. Okay, so the last tiger was shot in 1930 at Chuatrukan. Okay, and next we have a squirrel that is now believed to be locally extinct in Singapore. So, but before 1960s, this cream-colored giant squirrel was so common that it was often captured for food or kept as pet in the past. It was first discovered by Sir Stanford Raffles, and he noted that there was a lot of them in the forest back then. However, it has not been sighted in Singapore since 1995. So what could have called this mammal to go locally extinct in Singapore? It is believed that deforestation due to development and urbanization could be the cause for its locally extinction. Next, we have butterflies. So we always admire their beauty, but later do we, do we know that nearly half of Singapore's butterfly species went extinct? Maybe because of their small size in comparison to larger animals like the mammals, their disappearance may not feel as significant. In fact, almost half of our native butterfly species have disappeared over the last 160 years because of reasons like deforestation and loss of specific plant species. Okay, so moving on, um, not all is doom and gloom actually. While humans have, caused, have been the cause for wildlife concerns, the same human intervention can, can also be the reason for hope around us. And so let's check out some success stories that you might have read about in the newspapers as well. So the first one that we are looking at is the leopard cat. Okay, so if you take a look, this is a picture of a specimen of a leopard cat from the museum. So leopard cats are actually the last remaining wild cat species found in Singapore. They were found in really large numbers in the early 20th century. But these nocturnal animals are actually now critically endangered in Singapore due to loss of uh, forest habitat um, and things like that. 
So one of our museum staff, Marcus Chua, who is a mammal researcher, notes that there's actually no more than 20 leopard cats living on mainland Singapore. Okay, so this comes to our next poll question. So Marcus Chua, who is a mammal researcher at the museum, found out through his research that there's actually a larger population of leopard cats on one of Singapore's offshore islands. Can you all make a guess which island is it? Is it Pulau Ubin or is it Pulau Tekong or is it Pulau Hantu? The results seem to be quite close for this one. Okay, so that's about 80% of you who have participated. So let's end the poll and check out the correct answer. Okay, so the um, offshore island that it was actually found, uh, a lot of it was actually found, is actually P uh, Pulau Tokong. Okay, so Marcus's research found out that a larger population of leopard cats was found in Pulau Tokong. He recorded about 29 leopard cats over there, as you can tell from this newspaper article, which was featured on the Straits Times. So um, they appear to do better at uh, Tokong than on mainland Singapore because they do not have to compete for food uh, with other animals as much as they would they might have to in on mainland. So Pulau Tokong is actually 32 times smaller, but uh, even though that's the case, they seem to be flourishing over there. So we can see clearly about the potential use of such research, which can give us information on the animal's habitat use, uh, the range and the diet. So using things like um, population genetic analysis, we can actually find out the animal's conservation requirement. We can even see how the Singapore population of these animals are genetically similar to those of the neighboring countries. And this can actually make way for very effective conservation plans, which is why research is extremely important because action plans for certain wildlife, right? Uh, it doesn't only require efforts from just a certain country. It might require coordination from more than one country. So to find out more, you can check out a 13-minute documentary about the conservation of leopard cats produced by the Singapore Wildcat Action Group. And we've put the link in the chat box over here. It's just 30 minutes and it's extremely, extremely uh, useful to take a look at that video. Okay. So efforts to survey our nature areas like the Comprehensive Marine Biodiversity Survey, uh, CMBS for short, the Bukit Timah Nature Reserve Survey, have all contributed to new discoveries and rediscoveries. So despite the uh, fact that Singapore is so small, right, the fact that we can discover and rediscover wildlife probably hints there's a lot of things that we could do to help the wildlife and the environment around us. So all of this research and studies and surveys, they all help us to have a plan in place to conserve habitats. So for example, the National Parks Board has this species recovery program, which aims to conserve native biodiversity by reintroducing them and protecting and enhancing their habitats. Okay, so there's one uh, other, other animal that we'd like to look at, and that's the cinnamon bush frog. Okay, so this very pretty frog over here, right? It's a very beautiful rainforest frog, and it's actually slightly larger than your 50 cent coin only. So it's very, very small. Okay, it's confined to Bukit Tima and Central Catchment Nature Reserve. It's actually one of the additional species that is now identified for species recovery. Okay, so um, apart from birds, which all of us can probably recognize very easily, frogs are also very easily recognizable. Okay, so that's how characteristic they are. They have no tail, they have a very short body, they have long hind legs and short front legs. So they mostly have large bulging eyes and a very wide mouth. So let's have a little, uh, a bit of a science question now. Okay, so frogs gener generally leap very well. Which body part do you think best helps them with this? Is it their bulging eyes? Is it their short hind legs? Or is it their long hind legs? Okay, so this one should be quite easy. Are their legs, uh, hind legs short or long? Okay, I think you can end the poll now. Uh, and find out what's the correct answer. So 90% um, of you said long high legs, and yes, that's the correct answer, okay? So if you take a look at the next slide over here, uh, if you've ever wondered how frogs are able to leap very well, right? That's actually because their long hind leg has a very special extra joint that we've highlighted over here, okay? So this extra hinge allows the frog to launch its body very fast during a leap. 
Um, another interesting fact is that they have a shortened backbone that is connected to their hip joint. So this helps the frog to have its eyes directly um, ahead uh, when it's taking off and landing. So according to the Singapore Red Data Book, the cinnamon bush frog is considered vulnerable. And like what I mentioned earlier, it's actually one of the additional species that is now identified for the species recovery program. So it lays eggs in phytotherm. So phytotherm is a fancy name for tree cavity. So the holes that you find inside trees. Okay? And this is a microhabitat, meaning that it's a smaller habitat uh, within a bigger habitat. And this phytotherm is actually not common in our rainforest. So efforts are being explored to see if the artificial containers to um, mimic the microhabitats, I mean to mimic the phytotherm so that they look like that, uh, containing the tadpoles of this species can be translocated to other suitable nature parks in Singapore. So research on this was actually done before and it was and it was proven to be successful. So this program um, can help to expand their distribution. In fact, researchers at the end parks have already successfully introduced this uh, very pretty frog into the rainforest part of Singapore Botanic Gardens under this species recovery program. Okay. So um, the next success story that we're going to take a look at is the harlequin butterfly. Okay, So this is part of an ongoing species recovery effort. So this butterfly species is widespread throughout Southeast Asia, but it's very rare in Singapore. So NPARCS has started this captive breeding program with members of the butterfly circle group, uh, and there has been some success, and adult butterflies have actually been reintroduced to form a wild breeding population. So from all these three success stories, so these are the three success stories that uh, we've highlighted you. There's actually many more stories out there. So we can clearly see how research work is very important for species recovery efforts. So since we're talking about butterflies, um, I'd like to just highlight about this uh, project that the museum started on in 2019. So the museum started on a butterfly digitalization project with the aim to create a virtual collection of butterflies from Singapore and Peninsula Malaysia and um, funded by uh, various government bodies. Okay. So all the data of over 12,000 butterfly specimens in our collections are now shared in an open access international biodiversity database um, called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, GBIF for short. Okay. So if you want to find out a little bit more about the meticulous work that went into this process, you can take a look at the link with, which we've put in the chat box now. But how exactly does digitalization help biodiversity? So digitalization is to create online collections uh, it, and it's something that a lot of museums all over the world are currently doing. So this provides better access to our specimen data and it plays an important role in research planning. So for example, um, if you're a researcher from a country, let's say very far away, okay, um, all you have to do is just to use a click of your computer and you'll find out information about the specimen that you need. Okay. The next animal that we're going to look at is the oriental pied hornbill. And this was one of the responses that many of you gave when we asked the question when you were registering, uh, if you guys had any encounters with wildlife in Singapore. Okay, So the oriental pied hornbill, um, many of us would have read about the sightings of it or we've even seen it uh, in real life for ourselves. So these are very magnificent large birds that have a large down curved bill. It's very big and often brightly colored. They eat mainly fruits, uh, but can also eat insects and smaller reptiles, birds, and mammals. So even, uh, you definitely can see them, but you can also definitely hear them because they have a very harsh and penetrating call. But do you know that these birds were thought to be extinct in Singapore not too long ago, and they've now made a comeback due to successful conservation efforts. It actually vanished from Singapore in the late 1900s, and its first recorded return was at Pulau Ubin in 1994. So by the creation of artificial nests, boxes as part of the Singapore Hornbill project, it is actually re-establishing colonies in Singapore. Their population has now been expanding the last two decades and now the numbers are in the low hundreds. The next animal that we're going to look at is a crab. So this is called the Singapore freshwater crab, okay? uh, Johora singaporeensis. It can only be found in Singapore. So a word for this is called, to describe that is called endemic. So it is one of the three known species of crabs endemic to Singapore. And crabs, as we all know, they belong to a group of animals called arthropods. Arthro meaning jointed and pod meaning legs. So these guys have jointed legs. And arthropods are actually one of the most successful creatures on Earth because they are really hard exoskeletons help them to survive many different types of habitats. Okay, so um, one next question that we're going to look at is who first discovered and described this crab in Singapore? Okay, so this one could be a tough one. 
So A, is it Professor Peter Ng Hilin? Is it B, Charles Darwin? Or is it C, Dr. Nyo Mei Lin? Okay, so A and C are locals. B is not a local, of course. <laughs> Okay, I think we can end the poll uh, and we can share the results. So about half of you said that it's Professor Peter Ng Killing and you are right. Okay, so if you guys didn't know, uh, Dr. Neil Melin is actually uh, also known as the clam scientist in Singapore. So if you want to know a little bit more about uh, giant clam work, you can uh, Google her, uh, Dr. Neil Melin. Okay, but let's go back to the Singapore freshwater crab. So this uh, Singapore freshwater crab was actually first discovered and described by Professor Peter Ng, currently the museum's head, in 1986. So this crab is very small, just about 2 to 3 cm. So extensive habitat studies were done to find out suitable sites to translocate this crab to expand its distribution. And a uh, Bukit Tima, uh, sorry, Bukit Batok stream was actually found to be suitable. So as 60 individuals were translocated in 2015 and baby crabs were found a few months after. So this is a good indication that the species is indeed breeding at the new site and regular monitoring that is being done shows that the species is present. So this is somewhat of a success story as well. Okay. The next animal that we're going to look at is very interesting. It's called the Neptune cup sponge. So the Neptune cup sponge was absent from our waters for more than a century until the rediscovery of two individuals in 2011. So three more individuals were subsequently found. So now at the moment in Singapore, right, there's five locally known individual Neptune cup sponges. And this is the largest in situ population. That means originally found over here in the world today. So um, for the kids, it, for the kid participants in uh, today's session, right? Okay, um, Neptune cup sponges are supposed to be the same animals like SpongeBob SquarePants. So that's actually a marine animal called a sponge. Okay, so sponges are very simple animals. They have a lot of pores in them. Uh, hence, they belong to this group of animals called porifera, lots of pores. Okay, they don't have eyes, nose, and mouth, and they're filter feeders, meaning that they will filter the water to get their nutrients. So how exactly are we trying to conserve them? One strategy is actually to transplant them to locations that have them near each other to increase the chances of sexual reproduction. Okay, so according to NPARCS, the transplantation efforts that started in 2015 have been working. And NPARCS is also working with the NUS Tropical Marine Science Institute to try to experiment with other methods to slowly increase the population of these sponges. Okay, and why are these um, uh, Neptune cut sponges so important to Singapore? Because they are new to science and they are based on records in Singapore. So it's really very important that we try to preserve them and conserve them as much as possible. So one thing very interesting is that uh, we found that they were overexploited in the past, right? And there have been several suggestions as to what they could have been overexploited for. And one of the reasons could actually be uh, it was used as a bathtub for babies. So there was photographic evidence of people using them as a bathtub. Okay, so that's pretty interesting. Okay, the next animal we're going to look at is the Raffles Banded Langer. I think one of the participants who submitted their uh, answer before the session, right, said that she actually does uh, surveys with this very uh, charismatic uh, monkey. So I hope that person is here today. So the Raffles Banded Langer is also known as the Banded Leaf Monkey. It used to thrive around our island, but its population has greatly dwindled since. So there's only about 15 to 20 left in Central Catchment Nature Reserve in the 1990s. However, the, there's lots of efforts they were doing to help these animals. There's uh, collaborative efforts between the organizations and the universities in Singapore and Malaysia to enhance the forest habitat for the monkeys. Okay. So for example, right, there are reforestation and provision of more forested habitats like new nature parks. And these are what we call buffer parks. They act as green corridors that allow animals to assess a larger area to forage for food. So in a way, you can expand their living area. If you notice, know even in Singapore, you have an uh, increase in buffer parks around us. Like if you've been to Windsor Nature Park, uh, Thompson Nature Park. So well, yes, this means that as humans, we get to appreciate nature more, but it's actually um, much more benefits than, that, than just that. Okay, so this helps to increase the connectivity between our forested fragments, and it also helps to take human pressure away from very sensitive nature areas like Bukit Timah or the central catchment. 
All right. So the last animal that we're going to look at is, of course, the smooth-coated otters. Okay, so we've seen many of these uh, otter families around and a lot of them in urban areas as well, right? So these otters have somewhat become very iconic in our landscape. Uh, many of them found uh, crossing roads and frolicking around and some of them, uh, of course, eating some of the fish in our ponds. Okay, so due to habitat loss, urbanization, pollution and other factors, these mammals were in fact absent in Singapore for almost three decades. After the otter sighting at, at Sungai Bulo Wetland Reserve in 1990, it's now very uh, it's now quite distributed in Singapore. So this is an example of how important laws and like pub public-private relationships are important in allowing the return of this carnivore into our city-state. Okay, so from all the individual stories that I've gone through so far, it's very clear to see that the human influence on the environment and the wildlife around us can easily go both ways. It can be positive, it can be negative. It's sort of like a gray area. Okay. So human actions may have been uh, undoubtedly the cause of concern for negative impacts, but we certainly have the power and influence to reverse that. Okay. So how exactly are we um, adding stresses to the en uh, environment without even us realizing it? Okay. Okay. So next, we are going to discuss one of the key ongoing occurrence that's affected humans in so many ways and how this occurrence has affected our environment. Any guesses what is this key occurrence? Yes, it is the pandemic. Okay, so the pandemic has affected humans in so many ways. In fact, even the very fact that this is an online program instead of a physical one at the museum. But the environment is more than just humans, of course. How is the pandemic affecting other life forms around us? So research has shown that lockdowns around the world travel restrictions, and even a slowdown in economic activities have had unintentional positive impact. So such as air and water quality improve, there are lesser pollution due to the less use of transport, and even the possibility the reductions of greenhouse gas emission. Some nature spaces may seem to get some breathing space as well. However, we do see some negative impact on the environment such as the increased use of the personal protective equipment, mask and mask wearing. So here you can see many online articles about the increase in these ways, especially marine pollution. So masks were found along the Hong Kong's beaches and also other parts of the world, including the beaches at the UK. So marine pollution has always been a cause for concern because they can get ingested by wildlife or tangled up by them such as this seabird that got tangled up by the face mask. So with now an additional threat from this discarded face mask, this is very alarming. So closer to home, we even have issues like this. Face mask littering and handing off the branches of a shrub. So littering or even the marine pollution is already an ongoing problem. And the medical and plastic waste from the pandemic is certainly challenging. So the use of face masks and all these plastic and protective equipment, they are here to stay. But what we can change is our personal habit and behavior, which is the proper disposal of our waste. Another underrated things that we can do is also to educate the people around us and to raise awareness. So apart from the pollution generated from the pandemic, pandemic also increased nature appreciation. So we have seen the last year, as many of us could not travel, many of us, we seek our own backyards for nature, uh, nature appreciation. And nature appreciation is very important because it allowed us to find out more about the environment around us. And this could help the conservation efforts because we cannot conserve what we do not know. However, we may not realize that this increased visitation of nature spaces can add pressure to the nature space and the wildlife that resides there. So the high human traffic, they can add to the noise pollution, and these loud, loud noises may start up birds, for example, and cause problems like nest abandonment. And another common problem is that these hikers, some hikers, they tend to go off path and cause trembling in our vegetation. And some hikers even commented that they could, uh, there are more litters in nature spaces. So here you can see articles and photos showing you the huge crowd at these nature spaces. So for example, we have the large crowd along the rear corridor on a public holiday and the large crowd at Bukit Timah Summit. 
So there are ongoing efforts to address these overcrowding issues and these efforts include checking out the real-time map that tells you the crowd level of a nature space, shopping malls and other places. And it even tells you if a nature space is closed when it gets too crowded. Furthermore, we should all be aware of the proper behavior in the nature space, such as no littering and keeping our volume low, keep a distance from wildlife, and we can always appreciate them from afar and do not go off path as this is cause uh, trembling on the vegetation. Okay, and another cause for concern is actually the intertidal exploration. So in the tidal region, it's a space that is heavily influenced by the tide level. So in Singapore, we experience two high tides and two low tides a day. And when the tides are high, this region is submerged. And when the tides are low, the region is exposed. So you can find a lot of this marine life found in this area, and they are adapted to living in this region because they are able to cope with the fluctuating changes that these organisms experience here. And because this intertidal region is accessible to humans, we are able to see a lot of marine biodiversity up close, especially during the low tides. And we love to explore this area, and this is great for nature appreciation. But we should also be mindful of our nature etiquette, the do's and don'ts. So many of these animals that you can find them, they require constant moisture. So if you pick them up or touch them, it will cause them unnecessary stress. And even if you pick this animal up to bring them home, it should be avoided because these wildlife, they flourish best in their natural environment. For example, a small action of picking up a shell may not seem uh, to be significant, but the removal of a shell, even if it's a broken one, also means that you could be removing the potential home of another animal. So some animals, they do use these empty shells, even the broken one, as shelter for survival. So for example, the image on the right, you can see the hermit crab checking out an empty shell for its potential home. As this crab, the hermit crab, when they grow bigger, the protective shell, they do not. So they need to constantly find a bigger and suitable shell to protect their growing soft body. Okay, the case of human-wildlife interaction is not something new that has happened just as a result of the pandemic. So the pandemic situation has merely either increased it uh, or just changed it a little. Okay, and we can conclude which direction it has changed it once there is sufficient research evidence about that. So human-wildlife interaction has always been a topic of discussion, especially in Singapore, because there's a lot of blurred lines between our urban environment and our nature spaces. So another important topic that we're going to talk about is actually road kills. So road kills are undoubtedly a problem in Singapore. Our forests are fragmented and there is a lack of connectivity. So, um, and also to note, right, that nature spaces and the urban environment in Singapore is in very great proximity. So for example, if any of you have visited um, if any of you have visited Bukit Tima or Macwichi, right, you might realize that if you're deep into the trail, sometimes you might uh, hear vehicle sounds. So that's how close you are to the roads, even though you might be smack in the middle of a nature reserve. Okay? So this being the case, when a wildlife, uh, any animal, right, wants to move from one part of the forest to another, they sometimes literally have to cross the road. Then we don't see them, we end up crushing them, especially due to their small sizes. Okay. And this is worse, especially if it happens at night, uh, particularly so because a lot of these animals tend to be nocturnal. Okay. So sometimes the headlights of these vehicles can stun the animals, especially if they're on the road, and cause them to momentarily freeze. And this makes them even more vulnerable. So pangolins are one of the most critically endangered creatures in the world. And even though poaching, uh, we don't know how much of a concern that is in Singapore, but in Singapore, uh, pangolins are actually quite a big victim of road kills. Okay. So as we can tell, it's not just about species recovery efforts, but also efforts to restore habitats and their connectivity via, uh, via nature ways. So many of these projects are actually part of our green master plans that are continuously being updated.
Okay, so we have one final question for today. So eco bridges, which are actually uh, overhead bridges, which are created for animals, right? They help to connect fragmented forests and uh, it acts as a pathway for wildlife to use safely. How many eco bridges do you think we have in Singapore? Do we have none? Do we have one or do we have two? Is it none? Is it one or is it two? Okay. Okay, I think we can end the poll. It's a very close fight between one, uh, between two and one. And uh, let's take a look at the correct answer. The correct answer is actually two. Okay, so we'll just quickly go through what are the two eco bridges. I think the first one is um, an eco bridge that a lot of us would be familiar with. It's called the Eco Link at BKE. So this is the first purpose-built bridge for wildlife in Southeast Asia. It's 62 meters long. And if you're traveling on the Bukit Timah Expressway, you can very easily see it. Okay. So this is not for humans, it's only for animals. It connects Bukit Timah Nature Reserve to Central Catchment Nature Reserve uh, because until the expressway was built in 1986, right, these nature reserves, they were connected, but uh, now with this bridge, it's reconnected again. Okay, so um, the second eco bridge that we may not exactly be very familiar with is the more recent one called the Mandai Eco Link. So this is the second one. It's an elevated wildlife crossing that spans the length of the Mandai Lake Road and provides a safe passage for animals to cross between parts of the Central Catchment Nature Reserve. So how exactly do we know that the Eco Link is effective in facilitating the movement of animals between the nature spaces, right? You might be thinking like, we can see the bridge, but how do animals know that they have to use them. So if you look at the insides of these bridges, it's actually filled with lots of greenery, so it would naturally attract animals to use it. It's not a 100% solution, but at least it reduces the chances of animals going onto the road. Okay. So another way in which we can tell whether these are being uh, well used is by monitoring surveys using camera traps. So camera traps are motion sensor camera, which captures photos or take videos when it senses movement. Okay. So camera traps have been used during monitoring surveys and it shows that animals indeed use these eco bridge. Okay. So even though animals cannot be forced to use them, but efforts can and have been done to encourage their use. Like what I said earlier is the use of native plants. So there's also efforts to help animals locate the bridge as well. And that is why research efforts and studies on like things like road uh, kills are very, very important. So this brings me to the next point, which is about how we can help as members of the public. Okay, so for example, there's this environment group called the Herpetological Society of Singapore, HSS for short. It is an environmental group that studies herbs. It's a group of animals comprising of reptiles and amphibians, and they've started this effort to compile details of road kills. So um, you can send in information like the date and time of the encounter, photograph of the animal carcass, that means the dead body, and the GPS coordinator, uh, coordinates as well. So you might be thinking, what exactly is done with all this information and how is it possibly useful? So one big thing is actually to inform policy makers. If you can identify the roadkill hotspots, right, we can choose where to put the road harm, signages or like underpasses or eco bridges. And with this information, we can identify the species of concern. We can map the frequency to identify the roadkill hotspots. And of course, one of the most important things that we can do is to do outreach on this this road kill using this information. Okay, so to do all this is required more data than we have currently. So if you ever come across a road kill, one very simple thing that you can do is actually to uh, click uh, on this link and you can submit your road kills as well. Okay. So apart from road kills, we have also encountered many wildlife as we share the urban environment with them. There's a lot of visitation to nature areas and we get increased wildlife encounters like sighting of crocodiles, as you can see from this newspaper article. This one was spotted crawling out of the water and resting in the middle of the walking path. And of course, more recently, there was a famous spotted wood owl at Pasir Ris Park, which fell down the tree quite a few times. Okay, so And of course, the many sightings of smooth-coated otters in our urban environment. 
Okay, so apart from the pythons in our neighborhood as they feed on the rats and our pest control, we even have a rare visitation of a king cobra near Marsling MRT. So these are just very few newspaper articles. I'm pretty sure a lot of you would have seen many more and uh, of such articles before. Okay, and of course we have the wild boar attacks and people uh, getting caught feeding these small animals as well. Okay, so now let's go back to the start before we introduce our guest speaker for the next section. Okay, so from some of your responses that you gave to us, uh, one of the most common animal encounters seem to be that with the macaques, hornbills, and the wild boars. Okay, so uh, maybe I'd like to address the fact about the macaques first. So if you've ever been to a nature space, like a nature reserve, you would have seen this very curious long tail macaque. Sometimes they'll be waiting at the fringes of the nature reserves, right? And they seem to be waiting for food. Okay, so the thing with these macaques, right, they are wild animals and they do not need feeding. Okay, but unfortunately, even though how uh, positive our intentions may be, uh, us feeding them will cause them to get conditioned to the fact that humans are meant to feed them. Okay, so then in the end, uh, whenever they see humans carrying a plastic bag, they might end up thinking that the plastic bag has food, but maybe the plastic bag doesn't even have food. Okay, so over time, sometimes this might cause aggressive behavior from these monkeys and it might eventually lead on to other things, such as people complaining about these animals to authorities and of course having um, to do, having to make painful decisions such as culling the animals. So um, being the wild animals that they are, one thing very important to note that is that they do not need feeding. Okay, So please do not feed wild animals. And of course, if you see others trying to feed them, please do not, uh, please tell them not to as well. Okay. So um, next on, let's call our, our guest speaker uh, who works a lot with wildlife and has plenty of experience with human wildlife interactions as well. Okay, so for our last section today, we have a guest speaker from ACUS, Animal Concerns Research and Education Society. So her name is Miss Anbarisi Bupal and she oversees the education, fundraising, animal crime investigation and the campaign projects at ACUS. So she has about 15 years of experience in this field and has an educational background in uh, these areas and her interest lies in empowering members of the public to make a difference to animals and the environment around them. Okay, so let's call on Anbu and she will share her screen. Thank you very much. Uh, hi everyone. Um, let me share my screen first. Okay, um, thanks so much for this opportunity. Um, it was quite interesting to also hear uh, from uh, both of you on um, the other aspects and uh, also I think you have covered most of the things that um, uh, our native wildlife are actually facing in this urban habitat. So uh, just to quickly uh, start off at Acres, we are a local charity organization. What we do is basically speak up for the animals, give them a voice. So uh, we do this through different focus areas. I think uh, many of uh, many people might know us for the wildlife rescue work that we do um, and we also uh, work on wildlife management issues that is where the human wildlife conflict issues come about. So um, talking about uh, human wildlife conflict the first thing that comes about from also you know all the answers and queries that uh, the participants sent in. Uh, monkeys come first unfortunately uh, they are very smart they learn very quickly so um, they can be called, labeled naughty very quickly as well. So we have the long-tailed macaques who are not only found in the forested areas and the fringe of forested areas, but also in residential areas now. They can be sighted crossing uh, residential areas using park connectors. Talk with just uh, not feeding the animals, but also other things that you can do, I will share with you briefly. And we also come across Sorry, something is wrong with, okay. We also come across wild animals who get into trouble uh, due to built structures. Like what was shared earlier, um, while habitat fragmentation is an issue, animals try to cross from one green patch to another green patch. That's where we, they have to take the risk of crossing man-made bar barriers. It could be as simple as even a drain. And this pig has ran for a long time, this wild boar, and got very tired. They are prey animals. They are designed to run um, for a long time and um, then they crash, that's what they do. And uh, this pig had to be um, you know, sedated, tranquilized and then moved outside into the forested area and released. 
this Pongal Park, actually, the video here, which I'm going to play. So um, you can see that the trash is put in a trash bag and left beside the trash bin. So whoever did it, did the right thing to do. But I think we have to go one step further because this monkey is has quickly learned that um, he can actually eat uh, from the trash bag. So they quickly associate that the plastic bag means food and human food is really junk food for them. Just like us, I think they also like... Um, you know, um, high sugar, high uh, sweet uh, stuff as well. So they go for it and it becomes a problem. Yeah. And uh, people also feed uh, monkeys from cars. Sometimes if you go to um, Thompson Road as well, you come across these issues. And I will tell you why this is really bad for the animals. Not just the food that is given, there's a bread piece that is given here, but also something else happens to these animals. And beans. Uh, people who live close to nature areas, you will come across monkeys coming to your areas because we are living in their habitat, which is the fringe, the forest fringe. And when we live there, we have to also adapt, um, adopt certain measures. Uh, like these bins will not work in the long run. We need to use other methods to ensure that uh, the macaques do not have access to the bins. So measures like these, which is um, a bungee cord, will be very helpful as well. It is very simple. It's only $2. You can uh, get it from the stores and um, it prevents access for the monkeys to come in. So in our behavior, we need to change a little bit of, you know, opening the bungee cord, opening the lid, putting the trash and securing the bungee cord again. So these kind of advisories are also available, not just with Acres and Parks has it. Uh, Jane Goodall Institute has it. We have a long tail macaque working group in Singapore. There's so much resources out there to um, learn a little bit more about what else can you do. And for wild pigs, uh, it is pretty sad in Singapore at this point because um, wild pigs are you know, larger. When there is a road traffic accident involving a pig, it can injure the motorist as well, uh, whether it's a rider or it can affect the car, impact the car also. Uh, but again, uh, behind this story, we also notice that so many people actually feed them um, mainly because it makes them feel good and they also sometimes think that these pigs don't have enough food. And so uh, under the New Wildlife Act, it is illegal to feed them. And uh, some of the things that's helpful for you to understand is that uh, not to use flash photography, even though you're not using a big camera, you're using your handphone camera, it can still trigger a defensive response. We have to remember that wild balls are, uh, you know, prey animals. Something goes wrong and there's a crowd a lot, it can actually get worse. So it's important to uh, keep a distance, not crowd around. Um, and, it, you know, it, it might not even fit the COVID <laughs> regulations sometimes, uh, this kind of crowding. So this happened in Pasirins and uh, thankfully NPACS also helped us to cordon off the area. So we can actually reunite the baby uh, owl on, along with the parents. So it has happened a few times. Uh, this is not our photo. Um, but this was for a barn owl. It's amazing that these animals are coming to our urban spaces. So it's important that we have to give them that space that they need. Ask why are we doing this? Uh, why should we learn about wildlife etiquette? We all take the, you know, take the effort to learn how to use an escalator safely, how to use a road safely. Uh, okay, personally, before we let the, the audience ask you questions, I have a question myself. Uh, what's the most... Uh, Interesting. You said you've been in Acres for about 15 years, right? Is there anything, yeah. any one particular incident or scenario that has stuck in your mind for, for over these 15 years? Um, quite a few rescue cases. I was involved in rescue operations for about 10 years. So uh, I've seen different kind of callers. And uh, I have to say that majority of the people who call us are people who care about these animals. They call us to you know, help the animals. So once there was a case of a python at the canal in Congo, uh, yeah. there was a huge crowd. They all want to you know, um, uh, get the snake out of there. And when we arrived, we spoke to people, we raised awareness. We said that the snakes use canals. It's like an MRT system for them. And then the drains are where the rats are. So they hang out to navigate around. So we explained, we spent a few minutes and all the joggers and walkers, they said, oh, can you please then take the snake from the park connector and put back in the mm. canal? Uh, that was really touching. And you know, that gives us hope that uh, education is actually the key um, and uh, communication as well. So we have to continue doing that uh, to promote coexistence. 
Yeah, I think um, you, the ACAS Wildlife Rescue Team is 24-7, right? Yes. Yes, and I think um, it, it's quite a thankless job, I would say, because they are 24-7 and then there's callers all the time and there's only so few of you um, doing this wildlife rescue. So I think that's very, uh, it's something that we all need to appreciate as well. Yeah. Okay. So, Thank you for <laughs> Okay, so um, let's now go on to the last part of today's session. So we hope that you've learned a lot and now we're going to come to questions and answers. Okay, so we're going to have Anbu uh, to answer some of these questions together with us as well. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the questions that we have. Okay. All right, that's true. So what can teachers do in primary school, uh, primary school teachers to promote biodiversity conservation? Okay, Anbu, do you want to try that? Because uh, Acres does work with schools as well, right? Uh, yes, that's right. Mm. So we have our humane education programs. Mm -hmm. um, actually, one of my colleagues who is a trained educator, uh, she's our education executive, she is also watching today. Mm -hmm. So um, we do uh, talks on wildlife etiquette, particularly native wildlife protection um, and also on illegal wildlife trade. There are different issues related to conservation that we do for very young kids, even preschool kids. Uh, we even did a recent sing-along session for toddlers. So it was quite an interesting experience to you know, break down the message for different age groups. Um, so you can definitely, you know, engage us. And uh, there are also other groups who do education work uh, programs as well. Yeah, like what we said earlier, um, the museum, uh, my team, the outreach and education team, we also do a lot of uh, programs, um, let it be on biodiversity adaptation, on animal classification, evolution, so various topics. And I think it's very important, uh, especially with primary school teachers, it's to actually introduce these topics to uh, students from young. Because I think uh, a lot of wildlife topics are not actually um, within our syllabus, like in a very obvious manner. So be it with organizations like ACO, or the museum, it's always good to go out there on like learning journeys to learn more about these animals and these topics as well. Okay, so how do, how do sponges reproduce and do marine life eat the Neptune cup sponge? So the Neptune cup sponge don't eat, just drink uh, to get nutrients. Okay, so Cherry, do you want to try answering this? <laughs> All right. So yes, uh, sponges they do reproduce. In fact, uh, some sponges they can uh they can reproduce sexually, whereby they will produce the eggs and sperm in the water, or mainly sperm in the water, and then the sperm will actually go through the pores of the female sponges. And I think there are a few species of sponges they can also reproduce asexually through the budding method. Okay. And yes, I believe they are marine life. I'm not sure about Neptune cut sponge, but for other sponges, yes, other marine life, they do feed on these sponges. And yeah, um, so for Neptune cut sponge, they don't eat, just drink to get nutrients. In a way, yes, they feed through filter feeding. So you all know just now the photos, you can see a lot of pores, right? So the water will go through these pores and these pores will trap nutrients and trap food for the sponges to feed on. So in a way, they do just drink, they through filter feeding. Yeah, uh, let's scroll down to see. Okay, this is a very interesting question. How do we choose which animal to conserve? Does it depend on the aesthetics of the animal, the branding, like the Singapore crab, or the ecological impact of the animal? What about other animals that are also endangered but do not have these values? Okay, I think there's um, no answer to this question, but what this person has highlighted is very correct. Uh, unfortunately, because of certain animals, like they seem very cute, to us, they look very nice looking. And so we end up having a lot of like affinity for them. So we end up conserving them just because they look very nice. And even like the example that we showed earlier about the Harlequin butterfly, uh, maybe like uh, the fact that it's rare in Singapore, it's probably very difficult to notice because butterflies as compared to a huge animal like a mammal, uh, if that one goes uh, missing, it's probably much more easy to realize that as well. So it's very difficult to choose. And of course we have different scientists working on different things. So I just, that's the best part about science and research. You have different uh, researchers working on different topics and different aspects, and you can focus on different things that way. What do you think, Anbu? I totally agree with the fact that uh, some animals do, uh, are challenging, some animals are challenging to uh, raise awareness on. Uh, but so far, we have noticed that uh, there might be some animals who are chosen as like some almost like a flagship species. Mm -hmm. So it does help the other animals in the habitat too. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, let's try to see. Ah, okay. I think this one would be interesting for Anbo to answer. So in the event that wildlife breaks into our premises and steal food, what's the best action? So uh, when, say, a monkey, right, who comes inside and steals the food, it's uh, good to uh, see exactly what happened um, objectively. So um, this, if there's a monkey who enters your unit to take food, this monkey, I can assure that this monkey has been fed by someone from a similar unit, uh, either the same block or an adjacent block along the street. Uh, that's why they condition to learn that there's some food. So in order to break that cycle, it is important that the windows are kept closed for a few days at least. So if there is a single monkey found in a residential area, they will usually take up to two to three weeks to pass that area and leave, mm -hmm. go, you know, travel to the next um, estate. So we do need the help and cooperation of the residents, every single resident to, yeah. um, you know, keep the place closed and store food in opaque containers uh, instead of plastic and, uh, you know, things that are visible, very attractive uh, for the animal to take. So all these things actually really help us, uh, help to, you know, prevent the monkey coming inside. So if it is about the monkey, yeah. yeah. I think a lot of times we talk about like what are the authorities doing, what are the laws and regulations in place. But one thing that really has to supplement and close the loop is actually a behavior from people, mm -hmm. like how we how our habits are. We need to of course change them as well because if you realize that a lot of these problems are actually um, unfortunately started because of humans. Yeah. So yeah. even even this word human wildlife uh, conflict is something that I personally don't really like to use because it shouldn't really be like a conflict. It's more like of an interaction and whether it's like positive or negative. Yeah. yeah. Because we always think of us as like the centerpiece of nature and an environment, but we fail to realize that we're actually just part of it, not like the centerpiece or anything. Yes, that is so, you said it so well. Uh, that's why the word etiquette is so important because it, it's based on our behavior when we encounter wild animals. Yeah. Okay. I'm very aware that we have already overshot the time. It's already 4.17. Okay. So uh, we've come to the end of today's session. Thank you so much, Anbu, for uh, giving that really good presentation and for answering our questions very uh, patiently as well. Okay, so um, we'll just go on to the last slide. We just wanted to touch on the Singapore Green Plan 2020, uh, which was actually spearheaded by various government ministries. I think this is something that a lot of us would have also read about in the newspapers. So please do go check out about it as well. It's projected that by 2030, right, we'll have about a lot more green spaces than we already have. And that's just fantastic for the biodiversity around here. But of course, as more boundaries get blurred around around, uh, all this human-wildlife interaction is just going to get a lot more. So it's probably an, a solution that's just ongoing all the time. Yeah. Okay. So um, we've come to the end already. And uh, we actually have a second Thursday talk shop session next week on 17th of June, same timing. Uh, and if you haven't already signed up for that, we've put the link in the chat box so you can sign up for that. And we're going to be uh, talking about uh, dispelling myths uh, and some misconceptions as well during that session. Okay. So in the chat box, we've also put other links uh, to download our ebook. 200 points in Singapore's natural history. So you can find out a lot more about uh, Singapore's history over the years uh, on this free ebook that you can download from our website as well. Okay, so uh, we would really greatly appreciate if you could take a little bit of time to um, complete our feedback form, uh, which you can do by scanning the QR code over here. Okay, or if you have your phone right beside you, you can just click on the tiny URL link and go over to fill in the feedback. If not, thank you very, very much for attending today's talk shop. We hope that you enjoyed yourselves and learned a little bit more about human and our wildlife interaction and what happens when the lines get blurred a little. Okay, so if you have any questions, feel free to send it in uh, to this email as well. So that's the email of the Outreach and Education Unit at the Lee Kong Chen Natural History Museum. Okay, so leave this, uh, we'll leave this QR code up for a while. So if you are able to, kindly fill in the feedback form, please. You can also include other topics that you'll be interested to learn about from the museum. Uh, and if it's possible, we'll try to cover it for the future talk shop sessions as well.